Well, good morning, my friends and those friends watching on YouTube. I'm so delighted today to uh, welcome my friend and my dear brother, Jinpa, Tupton Jinpa. Well, most of you know Jinpa from, uh, from watching him being next to the Dalai Lama. Jinpa, has, Jinpa is and has been the Dalai Lama's principal English translator since 1985, right? Yeah, back when even I was young. <laughs> <laughs> In that role, Jinpa serves as a bridge uh, between languages. He's bridging Tibetan and English. And he has been in that role in, in other instances as well, translating many of the Dalai Lama's books. Uh, however, it, he's beyond that. He's not just the Dalai Lama's main translator. He is an eminent scholar in his own right. He is the president of the uh, Institute of Tibetan Classics. He is a chairman of uh, Mind and Life. And he's, also, he's a visiting scholar at Stanford University. And in that capacity, he created uh, the Compassion Cultivation Training Program, the CCT program. And overall, he is uh, one of the most eminent scholars in the world on the, on the, on the field of uh, compassion. So in that sense, Jinpa serves as another bridge. Jinpa is bridging some of the most advanced teachings in Tibetan Buddhism into, into like, the modern world, to our world. Like, in his, his translating the teachings in words that even I can understand. So that's his, the service he's providing. In addition to that, having known Jinpa for a while, uh, I can tell you, uh, in person, he is just as you expect him to be, maybe better. He is kind, he's wise, he's very gentle, uh, and uh, he's too modest to tell you this, so I'm going to tell you. He is the model of embodiment of compassion. He's, he's the model of what it's like to use compassion to transform your life. And so this, he's here to talk about his, his latest book, A Fearless Heart. And with that, my friends, uh, please welcome my dear friend, <coughs> Dr. Jinpa. Um, thank you, Meng, for um, your very warm words of uh, welcome as well as in introducing me. Um, and good morning. Um, thank you for coming and sharing this morning, a uh, brief moment with me. And um, I um, realize that actually a large part of you are uh, trainees or instructors of uh, Search Inside Yourself, which is a program that uh, Meng developed. And uh, based on that program, Meng also wrote a very successful book that has been internationally received so well. And um, I'm delighted to be spending this morning with particularly the instructors of Search Inside Yourself, uh, which I see as a, a powerful and beautiful combination of two great insights of our time. One is mindfulness, and the other one is emotional intelligence. Um, and um, you know, I take my hats off to all of you who have dedicated teaching this and spreading this to the larger world. Um, <clears throat> um, it's also um, you know, a joy for me to be able to uh, say a few words on a topic that I'm personally very passionate about, compassion, and uh, particularly uh, at this place, Google, uh, which you know, is over the last decade or so, has increasingly become very important presence in everybody's lives. And that's a fact. And um, so uh, to be able to say a few words on compassion on the campus of Google has a special meaning for me. And because I see one of the very important aspects of compassion is the universal global dimension. Just as Google has this very universal and global presence, um, I see compassion as probably one of the most, if not the most, important uh, place um, in the interface of uh, you know, uh, individuals interacting with society, individuals acting with each other, and cultures and societies and communities uh, interacting with each other. And I genuinely believe that the time for compassion has come. Um, in some ways, um, 
the realization of the importance of compassion in our society and time has really been forced upon us. Um, you know, and, and there are powerful forces in our time which are bringing the various cultures and communities of the world closer. Um, we are now, it's, it's a cliche to say that we are living in a truly globalized world. Um, in the old days, um, you know, there wasn't much cost to um, having a view of world that is parochial, where you have a slightly bigoted uh, sense of the importance of your own version of history and your own version of what is how to structure a good society. But now we're living in a, in a, in a time where these, even these ideas, which may seem you know, part of an individual's kind of bias, have important implications in how we relate to others and how we interact with each other. And in this kind of world where increasingly we are seeing, you know, through this very close encounters between cultures and ideologies and religions and ethnicities, we are beginning to see pressures building up. Um, so then the question is, how do we equip ourselves to be in a world where that kind of pressure is brought to bear on a daily basis? Um, and particularly in the West, um, you know, unlike many, some other parts of the world, um, Western countries in general, and particularly in North America, like Canada and US, are truly multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural communities. You know, we live in a time and, uh, and a world uh, in our society where, you know, on a daily basis, we interact with people from completely different background, you know, people who look differently, even physically. So I think North America, as a result of this experience, probably has something to offer to the larger part of the world where people are struggling. You know, we saw a part of that in France, um, where there's a substantial minority uh, of people, and uh, you know the French, France as a society is struggling to incorporate that element of diversity within there. So I think these kind of pressures are being built, and also uh, His Holiness often reminds us that, um, that one of the the plus side of the growing environmental degra degradation is that it is reminding us that we are living in one world. You know, we may have different ideologies different national policies, national interest, but environment doesn't care. You know, when things go at the environmental level, it doesn't care how rich your country is, you know, how powerful your country is, the impact of environmental degradation is going to be felt everywhere. So that also is bringing, reminding us that we are in this all together. So in this kind of age, there are pressures coming from the societal structures and changes which is really forcing us to come up with a, a new way of seeing the world, new way of being in the world, a new way of thinking about others and ourselves. And in this area, I genuinely believe the message of compassion has a powerful role to play. Um, now, one could say yes, but compassion is something that we humans have been talking about and thinking about for a long time. If you look at all the great teachings of the religious traditions going back to 3,000 years, you know, compassion is really at the center of the ethical teachings of these great traditions. So, you know, we, you know, the religions have been teaching us about compassion for all these years. You know, what is so different now? You know, what makes you think, or what makes me think, that the message, is, message of compassion is now going to be taken more seriously when it has been not taken that seriously for all these years? Um, and here, I think, the new science that is emerging that has to do with understanding empathy, understanding compassion, understanding the role of altruism in development of human behavior and human evolution, I think is making a difference. Because in the, in the past, <clears throat> we have viewed and related to qualities like compassion and altruism as part of the religious values, something that we ought to do. And when we relegate these values to something that we ought to do and part of our moral value system, then one of the interesting things about that is that our relationship with these qualities uh, acquire a flavor that brings in guilt. 
you know, when we think about these qualities, when we see then see the need in the world, and when we are not able to act out of compassion, we feel guilty, and guilt leaves a kind of a rather, you know, sour taste in our mind. And then we, because nobody wants to feel bad about themselves, then we tend to instinctively learn to avoid and even instinctively turn our gaze. And that is this dynamic that we develop. But now, with the new science, we are increasingly realizing, actually, these qualities are really part of who we are, that are part of our natural makeup. So it's, it is not really, I mean, although historically, it was the religious traditions that really took the responsibility of spreading the message of compassion, love, consent of concern for others' well-being, and so on. But in themselves, as His Holiness often reminds us, in themselves, they are completely independent of religion. And now there are new research showing that, in fact, you know, qualities like compassion and empathy are, in fact, inborn. You know, children as young as six months old, uh, through some very, very ingenious um, experiments that were d done by some psychologists, you know, demonstrate powerful preference to helping behavior as opposed to hindering behavior. There's a beautiful, um, actually, experiment, which is probably on YouTube. You can see it shows um, children, you know, watching a video where there is a kind of a cartoon, two characters, and there's a slope. And, uh, one of, and, and these cartoon characters have been anim animated, so they are images of eyes and mouth so that children can relate to them as being you know, sentient. So one object tries to go up, and it keeps falling down and goes up. So in one scene, there's another object that comes from behind and gives it a push to help it. In another scene, the same thing goes on, but now this time another object comes from the top and actually pushes, you know, pushes it back so that it obstructs it. And children show inevitably preference for the helping behavior. And when they are given the choice to choose toys, you know, and they, they did that with you know, all sorts of variations of colors and shapes, and they always choose the one that helps. So this kind of bias towards helping behavior is built in us you know, very, very early in our age. And then there are some interesting experiments that shows that children about the age of 14 months, they instinctively engage in helping behavior. And this was done by a team of two German scientists from Max Planck Institute, where uh, one of the experiments involved uh, the experimenter trying to dry clothes on a clothesline and drops accidentally one of the clothes pin and pretends can't reach it. And the child, about 14 months old, looks and then immediately gets up and, you know, even though the child may be playing, gets up and picks it up and give it to the person. And they found out that actually they do, children do this naturally and instinctively, but if you reward them, mm. then they don't do it again. So it's interesting. And there's something, some important message here for the parents, because I know in the West it's quite well, widespread that you know, parents give money to the children to do the chores. <laughs> so I think there is some important <laughs> lesson for the parents here. You know, I, I resisted that, I, and I managed to convince my wife that uh, when children were getting older, we wanted them to do the chores. But I said, we will give them weekly allowance, but there shouldn't be any direct link between the money they receive and the chores they do. And I was so happy to see that you know, this experiment and felt that, OK, you know, my intuition was right. <laughs> so I think there are all these very, very cool findings coming from science that are increasingly showing that actually compassion is part of our natural instinct. It's actually part of our natural makeup. And furthermore, there are more and more research findings showing that, in fact, compassion is good for us. You know, His Holiness often says that many people feel that when they are they listen to compassion and they think about compassion and they think about kindness. Many people feel that to do compassion and to, to act out of compassion is good for someone else, the recipient, and not necessarily good for themselves. But he says that actually, the first beneficiary of your experience of compassion is you yourself. Because your compassionate act actually brings about a material benefit to the other is dependent on many factors. You know, including receptivity on the part of the recipient, you know, their state of mind. And sometimes you may have the best intention, but what you do may not be the right thing to do in the right situation. But when you feel compassion and, and reach out to someone, at that moment, you yourself have gained the you know, benefit of experiencing compassion. And, 
And in fact, in my book, I talk uh, quite a bit about this. And I you know, refer to compassion as the best kept secret of happiness. And that's one of the paradoxes of compassion as well as happiness. Because when we think about compassion, you know, sort of we, in a common sense or uh, intuitive kind of sense, would say, OK, yes, when we feel compassion, we are opening our heart. We are leave, you know, making room for, in our heart for someone else's problem and situation. It's a good thing to do, but it's not necessarily you know, a, a, a way to joy. Because one would, in fact, expect additional misery, because you are taking on more problem than you yourself have. But it turns out it's the exact opposite. You know, when we experience compassion, and studies have shown that people who act out of kindness, in fact, the psychologists refer to it as the helper's high. There's a, a chemical in the brain that are associated with the feeling euphoria gets activated. And so that's sort of a, an interesting paradox, because one would expect you know, more misery and distress you know, when you act out of compassion. But it, exact the opposite happens. And in, and if, but if you think about it, it's not really that much of a paradox. Because one of the things about the experience of compassion and feeling of compassion is at that moment, you, know, you feel deeply connected with someone in front of you. And that powerful sense of connection is very important part of human aspiration and human need. You know, we are social creatures, and our happiness and our suffering it really is determined by the quality of relationships that we have with others. You know, there might be few, you know, hermits, maybe one in a billion, you know, who will be able to be in a total state of joy, alone, without needing that interaction with a fellow human at, a, at the level of heart connection. But that might be one in a billion. But for most of us, you know, our experience of joy and our experience of suffering and pain really comes from the quality of relationship that we have with important pe people in our life, um, you know, colleagues at work, and other people that we have to interact on a daily basis. So, um, so when you experience compassion, you, you really feel connected to someone. And in that state, Basically, one of the important things that happens is that you learn to forget yourself. And it's this letting go of your sense of self or self-awareness that really opens the space for joy. So now take a step back and think about all the times when you felt most happy. I bet the common denominator is that ability to forget yourself. That's the paradox of happiness. You know, so if you really want a true joy, you have to let go of your own self-consciousness. And there is nothing more powerful than the experience of compassion to make that possible for you. So I think that's, a, that, that's probably the reason why compassion is the key to happiness. Another important benefit of compassion is that you know, because of this powerful dimension of being able to identify and connect with someone in front of you, compassion is the best buffer against the problem of loneliness. And loneliness is increasingly becoming an issue in contemporary society because we tend to live a more nuclear life. And many of, of us live also kind of alone. And in that situation, if you don't learn to be able to connect with someone, important person in your life at a deeper level, you know, whether it's a, being part of a community or being part of you know, having a relation, healthy relationship or strong family connections, loneliness is becoming an issue. There was a, a rather sad data that came out a couple of years ago which showed that in the United States one in five people report not having any person in their life that they can confide in. Now that's terrifying. You know, I mean, we humans are not meant to be living like this. Uh, so I think here, again, compassion is really the best buffer against that kind of danger of loneliness. And loneliness has real impact on your own longevity. You know, there were studies showing done on, uh, um, you know, old age homes where people, you know, who report, you know, frequent experience of loneliness. And, you know, it really correlates very strongly with uh, early, you know, death. So it, it, it is costly. It is costly. I don't think we were, even evolutionarily speaking, meant to be, you know, living like this. And another important fact about compassion is that when you are able to experience compassion and act out of kindness, 
it really, you know, creates a sense of purpose in your life. And there is nothing like feeling that you matter, whether it is at workplace or whether it is at, at your family, or whether it is in your relationship with your friends. When you know that you matter, it gives you a sense of purpose. And sense of purpose is again being found as one of the most important factors in personal happiness. And also there is a correlation between longevity and sense of purpose as well. So in all of these areas, compassion really does the trick. And, and furthermore, you know, for me, someone who grew up as a Buddhist monk in the traditional Tibetan Buddhist society, you know, living a moral and ethical life uh, is something that is part of our, as my aspiration. And compassion you know, provides us a powerful anchor of our personal ethics. You know, it provides us moral compass. So when confronted by a situation where you are in a moral dilemma, the best question to ask is, what is the most compassionate thing to do here? So it really gives you a kind of a moral compass, which really allows you to be clear, you know, what the priorities are. And if the situation calls for a tough, firm action, it needs a fierce, compassionate response. You know, compassion sometimes is misunderstood as just giving in and just, you know, uh, bowing down. That's not really the case. Compassion, what compassion does demand in a situation is that you never lose sight of the fact that the other person too is another human being just like me, you know, who wishes to se seek happiness and who wishes to overcome suffering. That much is really demanded by, a com you know, taking compassion as your your main moral ground to respond to a situation. But if the situation calls for a much tougher stand, you know, you can do it. I mean, if you look at people like you know, Nelson Mandela and, um, you know, Mother Teresa and His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, you know, these guys were not, you know, these people were not weak individuals. They were powerful individuals, deeply compassionate, but quite powerful and deeply committed to what they do. and very strong in their op opposition to injustice, so particularly social injustice. So sometimes we tend to you know, mistake compassion for kind of meekness and just giving in. And that's something that we have to bear in mind. So when you think about all of this, and also when you combine these understanding with the r realization that actually compassion is part of our natural instinct. That's one of the beauty of compassion. I mean, if you compare compassion to mindfulness. Mindfulness is you, something that you have to cultivate. You know, I think we are naturally, you know, uh, equipped with a mind that is very distracted. There was a study that shows that, you know, almost 50% of the time our mind is wandering, even if we are supposed to be focusing on something. You know, there was a study that came out from Harvard. So mindfulness is something that we have to actually cultivate and acquire a skill but compassion is something that we are all capable of doing naturally. And especially people who uh, have the experience of being parents know what it feels like to experience an emotion where the focus is completely the other. You know, where there is no self-referential and self-agenda involved. You know, a biologist, a cynic might say, yes, you will do this because the child in front of you is biologically related to you, all the rest and all the rest. But the fact is, in your actual experience, the focus is completely the other. And your ultimate goal of the, the interaction is the welfare of the other person in front of you. That is compassion. And that comes from a powerful instinct that we all have that craves to be connected with someone and, and this nurturing, caring instinct. And this, I think, is something that we have to keep in mind. Then the question is, if compassion is so good, and if it is natural, how come we don't use it more in our day-to-day -day life? That's an interesting question. And here, I think we have to take a step back and try to understand. Often, we bring resistances into, you know, into, with relation to compassion. At the cultural level, particularly in the West, since the popular official story of who we are as a species really comes from Darwinian evolutionary theory and the survival of the fittest kind of motto, and so there was a long tradition in the West, at least among the scientifically educated you know, uh, community, that ultimate explanation of human behavior 
really must be rooted in the pursuit of self-interest. And competition is the behavior that manifests from this pursuit of self-interest. So it's competition and pursuit of self-interest are seen as the ultimate explanation of human behavior and human evolution. And so much so that, I mean, when I first went to Cambridge to study Western philosophy, um, I was 30. And I, by that time, you know, my formal training in Buddhist studies have already been completed. And I was actually quite shocked to realize that how deeply embedded this idea that behind every human behavior, there must be some self-interest element that is the ultimate explanation. And the reluctance on the part of people to really allow the possibility of real altruism. That was actually quite shocking. And, um, and then later, of course, I came across um, uh, uh, these kind of ideas more formally presented in uh, works. And there is, in fact, a notorious statement made by an American biologist who said that, uh, scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. So I mean, that was a, you know, I mean, so those kind of ideas were the official version of who we are. And then when you have that kind of idea, then you become suspicious of genuine, charitable, altruistic behavior. You know, you either see them as, you know, abnormal, someone who are very special, and some people are born like that, and you don't really relate to these qualities as being part of your defining character. And, I th and also individually, we bring resistance to expressing our compassionate part, partly because of this kind of, you know, having bought into this powerful nar narrative, but also, you know, we, you, because in the West particularly, the contemporary culture, increasingly in, in different parts of the world too, you know, the, our society is structured in a highly competitive manner. And this competitiveness is introduced at a very, very early age, from, word, from the word get go. You know, from grade one, we are constantly exposed to evaluation, you know, judgment and cross comparison and all of this. So we internalize a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a self-preserving mechanism that you know somehow you know it's, it's a self-protecting mechanism that shapes the way in which we view our interaction with others and which colors our attitude to the things like compassion and so on so then we expect these only in a small informal setting of your own family life and friends and at the societal level we don't really expect these things so i think it's these resistance then we are afraid we bring fear we are afraid that if we are too compassionate and too kind it will be seen as a pushover, it will be seen as weak, and people will take advantage of me. And sometimes we also worry because in Western thinking, you know, we make a sh very sharp dichotomy between the rational part of who we are and the emotional part of who we are. And you know, going back all the way to Plato's time, that you know, there is this conflict. And, so if we, and because compassion is seen more as belonging to the emotion camp, you know, people worry that if they allow too much of their kindness and compassion to take over, that their rationality might get dimmed. They may not be, you know, tough that is required, that toughness might be undermined. So people, we worry, you know, and, and also <coughs> even in, you know, parent and ch children relationship, parents worry that if we are, you know, if they are too kind to their children, they, it, they might spoil the children and the children may not learn the toughness that is required in life. So we bring all these kind of fear and other resistance and that hinder the expression of our compassionate part. So what I present in the book is to really make a case that compassion does matter. It is part of our natural makeup and we can do something about it so that we learn to you know, really not just leave compassion at the mercy of situations because for most of us, we really leave compassion at the mercy of situations. You know, when it's triggered by a situation, we act out, we allow it. And, you know, when that happens, the most beautiful part of who we are really comes out. You know, look at the overwhelming response at the grassroots level to the Asian tsunami, to the, you know, earthquake in Haiti, and now in Nepal. You know, the governmental level responses may not be forthcoming immediately, but at the ordinary people's level, you know, international community has been very generous. And so when we are, but we leave it 
at the mercy of situations. You know, we don't really make it, but the point I'm trying to make in my book, as well as the idea behind the Stanford Compassion Training that I had the privilege to help develop, the idea is that we can do something about it. We can actually make compassion a proactive stand and a perspective or a mindset from which we relate to our world. And, and it's, it, once we're able to make it a proactive stance, and then we get a choice to be able to relate to any difficult situation, both personal as well as at the level of community and society, that we as individuals, if we make the choice, then we bring the best of our, ourselves into that situation. And whether it is in the area of conflict resolution, prevention of conflict, or healthy relationship, when we are able to bring compassion, even parenting, it changes everything. And in the end, we ourselves you know, you know, learn to live with joy. Because sometimes we, you know, we, we think that, well, compassion and these things are wonderful, but maybe sometime in future, you know, we will think about these things and we will, and, and people get so caught in what they're doing in the moment, whether it is job or making money and so on, and the people forget to live. And life moves on. This is where the Buddha's teaching on impermanence is very, you know, very, very powerful. The teaching on impermanence reminds us that the clock is ticking all the time. And if we don't learn to live on a daily basis, moment by moment, with joy and with the best of our part, then we miss. Because you can never go back and bring back that time that is lost. There's, um, uh, you know, one of my favorite authors uh, is this um, uh, Czech writer, Milan Kundera. He he wrote a powerful series of essays called Life is Elsewhere. You know, people live their life thinking that someone else is living a good life. And, you know, that what they you know, they forget that they're, act you know, they're actually living and they forget to live. And so this is why I think it's important that, you know, we, we in the end, um, you know, being able to live your life out of a compassionate standpoint, you know, you are the first one to stand to gain. Your, your relationships acquire a different quality. People enjoy being with you. And also, you learn to be at ease with, your, with, with yourself. You know, those who have had the chance to interact with His Holiness, you know, you will recognize here is a person who is totally comfortable in his own skin. You know, there is a, it, it's, it's a refreshing energy that you, you know, and, and that kind of freedom, that kind of sense of abandon, you know, that kind of flexibility where he's able to deeply delve into a situation, be completely empathetic, and do the best to help, then at the same time, switch off and move on to the next thing. I mean, that ability to switch modes and be totally at ease with himself, that comes from compassion. And that is doable. So then, how do we do this? And here, of course, there's a whole program that I've developed. Um, and you know, those who are interested can visit the Stanford website. And, um, but I would say a few things. One is, in our day-to-day -day life, we need to pay conscious attention to what is the place of compassion in my life. How, how, how does compassion figure in my hierarchy of value? You know, even those of us who don't see ourselves as religious, we are still moral creatures. You know, we are emotional creatures, we are rational creatures, but also we are moral creatures. And each of us have, whether articulated or not, we have a value system that organizes our life. And the values are those things, principles, that when you violate it, it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you feel that you haven't lived up to your own standards. Those are basically values. I mean, values is a fancy word, but basically it re relates to those kind of principles. And some of us, those who are within the formal religious setting, like Buddhism, then we have a consciously spelled out value system. But majority who live a more secular life, it may not be fully articulated, but it is. The, each of us has a value system. So then the question is, how does it figure within my own hierarchy of value and to make it more important? The second thing is to really make conscious effort to as much as possible, you know, make compassion part of our everyday intention. You know, whatever we do, you know, the, one of the beautiful practices from my Tibetan tradition is to every morning you set an intention to make this day meaningful, a purposeful, 
to make this day, you, know, you spend this day with more mindfulness, more compassion, and really pay attention to how your behavior affects other people. So it's a very simple practice. It, you can do it in one minute or two minutes. And so that intention setting on a daily basis, regularly, really has the chance to then shape our motivation. And motivation is what makes us do things. You know, we, if we are angry and feel kind of um, wronged, we act out. You know, if we feel moved and touched, we act out. So motivation is a powerful driver of human behavior. And the, you know, but most of the time, our motivations are not very conscious to ourselves. Motivation is the underlying reasons why we do certain things. Intentions are more conscious. So, of course, sometimes in everyday English, we tend to mix the two as if they're synonymous, but they're not. Intention has a more directed goal uh, and an and objective. Motivation is more of an underlying reasons why we do certain things. And the way in which you shape the motivation is to consciously shape your intention. And if you are able to bring compassion as part of that intention, there is a chance that it will become part of your motivation system. So once we are able to do that, then we will be able to bring greater awareness into our life. So when we are confronted with the situation, then awareness kicks in. And this is why, you know, like mindfulness type practices, like contemplative practices are so powerful because contemplative practice brings three gifts. One is attention, ability to pay attention. Second is to bring conscious intention so that you can live your life more consciously. And third is the ability to bring greater self-awareness into situation. So this is through you know, training. And when I speak of training, I don't mean to confine it to just commitment to everyday formal sitting. If people can do it, that's fantastic. But that's also, if people, some people are not inclined to that kind of approach, but you can you know, pay conscious attention, bring intention, and become more aware. And in this way, we can really change and transform. You know, and in the end, if we are able to live our life from a standpoint of compassion, it really acquires a totally different quality. And the Buddha was right when he said that with our mind, we create our own world. Effectively, what the Buddha is saying is that, saying is that although we may be all living in the, exactly the same physical environment, but the world that we, each of us experience is very different. You know, it, it, the differences come from the way we perceive the world, the attitudes we bring into the world, and the values that we you know, shape our outlook. And that changes the way we feel and experience the world, and that changes the way we behave. <coughs> and how perception changes you know, our feeling was powerfully demonstrated by a very simple experiment that was done where you know, subjects were sitting opposite each other looking at their own monitor. They were asked to wear headgear, and then they were listening to the same music at the same speed, and they were asked to you know, tap their fingers uh, according to the rhythm. So in one set of experiments, they all tapped in synchrony. In another set of experiments, they you know, were listening to different music, so they tapped differently in, without synchrony. And afterwards, they were exposed to a situation where one of their partners was unfairly kind of penalized, and the, they observed the response. And in those situations where people tapped in synchrony, they, were, they expressed much more sense of concern for their partner. And in the other group, where they were tapping in, not in synchrony, there wasn't that kind of stronger sense of concern. I mean, it's, you know, if you ask them, they wouldn't know that that was the thing that was you know, influencing their attitude and feeling about this person. So the point here is that if we consciously learn to view ourselves and others from a point, standpoint of compassion, it really has the power to change the way we feel about others. And, and that holds promise for transformation, you know, because when we think about spiritual transformation, sometimes people think about something far down the line, you know. But actually, really, I mean, you can on a day-to-day -day life, it makes a huge difference. So uh, let me just read few uh, words as a form of conclusion, and then I'll take some questions. Um, when we make a habit of compassion in our everyday lives through 
regular practice and action, we live with more courage, less stress, and greater freedom. In time, we will automatically see ourselves and the world in terms of interconnectedness. Our default position towards other people will be as fellow human beings rather than sources of antagonism and threat. Our new other-oriented habits will free us from the old habits of self-judgment, self-protection, and worrying about ourselves. Our relationships from chance encounters with strangers to our intimate connections with our close closest family and friends will be permeated with a sense of openness and kindness rooted in the understanding of our fundamental human condition, our shared needs, vulnerability, and the basic aspirations for happiness. We will habitually respond to all people's suffering and needs with compassion, unprejudiced by who they are in relation to us. Even when it comes to a difficult person who causes us problem, we will not lose sight of the fact just like me, he too is a fellow human who aspires to happiness and does not wish to suffer. These thoughts will have entered our fast system. Our actions too will reflect our deep, even cellular knowledge of the impact we have on others. Our habit of kindness will be reinforced over and over by the joy we take in being kind to others and seeing them happy. Being helpful will be our new normal. We will come to embody compassion, not just admire it as an ideal. We will learn to live it through our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. In short, making a habit of compassion will transform our lives. Thank you. In acting with compassion to others, what is our responsibility for thinking about their existing condition? And by acting compassionately to them, are they going to feel an obligation to act compassionately in response to someone who may, they may not be in a position to? Yes. And will that lead to resentment? Do we need to be worried about that? That's a very, very good question. Actually, I think when we act out of compassion towards someone, on our part, I don't think there should be any expectation of how they would respond. Because when we bring an expectation on our part, then it puts pressure on the other person. Because a true compassion is motivated by just the thought of wanting to do something for the other. And regardless of how that other person may receive the extended hand. So I think once that is, you know, and that, that's why sometimes a, a, a true compassionate response to a situation Maybe simply to let the other person know that you are there available, not necessarily doing something. And sometimes a situation calls where what is needed is just an understanding and a more empathetic ear rather than some solution. And this is why compassion, to act out of compassion is you need a little bit of wisdom. Because you know, you know, one of the beautiful things about compassion is that it offers us the ability to respond to suffering without you know, completely being you know, pulled by the urge to do something about and solve the problem. Um, you know, and especially for men, like we, we, don't, we are not very good at you know, dealing with situations where there is no obvious solution. We freak out, you know? <laughs> uh, and women are much better at this, uh, because, probably because of their maternal instinct. You know, sometimes with children, you know, they're throwing their tantrum, with their screaming their heads off. The best response is just to be there, you know, not to react, but show understanding and empathy and show the child that, you know, when he or she is ready, the mommy is ready, you know. But we, you know, I, I have raised two kids. My younger daughter is 16 and elder one is 18. Uh, I had a very easy ride with the elder one. But the younger one, when she was about between two to four, was a real you know, a challenge. And that's when I realized, actually, even someone like myself, who have come through the monastic training and always, always felt that I had a, quite a strong reserve of patience. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, and I said that in my book. You know, I've never experienced in my life where, you know, I've been driven to being so mad, you know. <laughs> but I, I think it's, you know, th so I think the most important thing is not to impose upon the recipient some kind of expectation. 
And when, when people know where you're coming from, and people are very dignified in the way in which they will receive or you know, say, okay, I don't need the help right now. So here you have to resist from being what the Americans call busybodies. You know? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, microphone. <coughs> what advice do you have for people who are managing people, so managers? Um, and are there any particular practices you recommend for people who are in positions of authority? Thanks. Very, very good question. Um, I think, I mean, now here I'm entering the territory where I don't really have much experience. I mean, I did have, the only management experience I have is really in the monastic area, in a monastic community um, where I was a member of a community that had about 400 monks. Um, and I was involved in the administrative side of that, partly because I was one of the few who actually spoke English. <laughs> um, but I've always found it in my own role in the management kind of experience that when you make clear where you are coming from, when your intention is clear, people are always much more accommodating. So I think that kind of clarity is very important. And then also, um, you know, a lot of, you know, many of us struggle with our egos and often ego comes in the way. Um, and in fact, um, you know, human beings are very, very complicated creatures. When there are more than two people, there is already a complexity. Um, so, and often um, much of the problem really comes not so much from the challenge of the actual work, but really the challenge of the dynamics of the personalities. So here, if you are especially more in the leadership kind of position, if you are able to bring an element of kind of, you know, um, egolessness, it's tough. But if, you know, if you're able to bring that, it really sets the tone. Uh, you know, I've been the chair of Mind and Life Institute for now about four years, and we have a very large board of about 12, 13 people. And um, um, I also noticed, not just in the monastic setting, but here too, you know, when I'm able to bring the best of my intention with no self-concern about you know, my ego, and it completely changes the dynamic. And it also sets the tone for everybody else to bring their best. So I think that's one important lesson. And also sometimes in the management, you have to make very difficult decisions and you have to learn to give the bad news. And here, I think a little bit of training and, you know, there's always um, a more compassionate way of conveying this news. And, and this is something that, um, uh, because in the end, um, you know, people are very, very forgiving and understanding when they understand that you did something because you had no other choice and you did it with full consciousness uh, and also a sense of concern. And people are, you know, they don't take it, they take it less personally. You know, the, the experience of hurt is very painful when that the recipient of that decision feels personally you know, discriminated against. Somehow, when, that, when the person takes it to be personal, that's when it becomes much more painful. So that's one um, suggestion. And on the, at the level of authority, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I just hope, you know, Bill George just left. You know, Bill George is involved uh, with Mind and Life Institute uh, in a very interesting a project called ASL, Academy of Ethical Leadership, where the Mind and Life Institute is trying to bring principles of compassion and empathy in leadership kind of, you know, uh, role. Um, but I think there is now people are beginning to think about how to bring mindfulness, how to bring compassion into this kind of equation. But at the moment, I think the dominant paradigm really is not that. You know, I mean, I even read uh, with horror some articles in the Scientific American a couple of years ago how, in fact, some kind of um, 
psychopathic you know, attributes are good in an, in an efficient leader. <laughs> so, so right now, the current kind of you know, you know, paradigm is really that. But I think mindfulness and uh, compassion is beginning to make inroads. Because in the end, even from the point of the view of the leaderships themselves, at the personal level, they're all individuals like ourselves. You know, they're worried about their family, they're worried about their reputation, they're worried about their well-being, they're worried about their fame. You know, they're all individuals. And even from the point of view of their own self-care, you know, something like having a more principled approach to their leadership role is in their own personal interest. And those kind of realizations will gradually come. Uh, I had a question about the, the Good Samaritan experiment about how they, the person who was going to give the lecture on the Good Samaritan, when they were rushed, wouldn't help someone on the way. Sure. And I've been wondering for a while, from the perspective of compassion, what is actually going on? And I'm asking specifically in, in Silicon Valley, where the competition between companies has a lot of rushing. There's a lot of who can who can be first, and it's just part of our jobs. Yes. And so, I'm trying to understand what what really is the mechanism for being rushed, undermining compassion, and what is it? Is there a particular focus or, or practice in terms of compassion that can help to ward that off? That's a that's a very very. Um Good question, and I, I've also read that study and was, uh, you know, quite intrigued. But I understand because, um, you know, um, when we are in a rush, okay, our attention completely shifts. And in order to be able to tap into your compassion, you do need to allow the attention to be there. Because, you know, because without attention, you don't understand the situation. And without understanding the situation, you don't connect with the situation. And for us to act out of compassion, we need to feel that connection or identification. And when we are in rush, we don't our, allow ourselves. And especially if you are rushing to an important meeting, even before you are physically there, mentally you are already there. And it leaves no room for us to actually allow ourselves to be attentive to the need in front of us. And so this is... Um, an important factor. I mean, so, and when we think about this, we people start thinking, okay, then that means you need a lot of time. But that's not true. Attention, awareness of situation, and connecting with the situation, these all things happen very, very fast. But we do need to allow that initial space. And this is what is not happening when people are really rushing, and especially with the, when they have already rushed with their mind. Now, ideally, if we take compassion as part of our daily experience more seriously, then we will be able to learn to be more in the present. And then even if you have to rush to a meeting, you know, while you are walking, your mind is still with you, instead of the, your mind already being there, which then precludes you from, prevents you from being able to connect with what is in front of you. So that's probably one, um, you know, f factor. Um, but you as to the larger question of this highly competitive, you know, fast-paced um, culture, um, I it's I don't know. I mean, I it, it's you know the the influence of Silicon Valley's discoveries and invention is just so so powerful, um, and um, I just wish that once in a while people in the leadership position would take a step back and reflect on what is the larger implication at the societal level with all these things that we're bringing out. Uh, you know, the recently the Apple brought out the iWatch. Um, you know, I just hope that their motivation is not just selling us another need with making more money. If that is the case, it's, it's troubling. Um, so, and, and but on the other hand, you know, the world is so driven by economic needs and um, 
you know, countries and companies uh, constantly come up with their quarterly reports and growth uh, projections and so on. And in this kind of highly charged, you know, kind of pressured approach, I don't know if people have the time or the space to step back. Um, so, and, and, you know, and, but there is a kind of a moral responsibility. Um, although, uh, you know, most people in the actual business may argue that it's not none of their business. How people use the technology, what is an offer, is up to the individual's uh, choice. But, in the, but at the same time, that's not completely true. Once you change the culture through this technology, everybody has no choice but to participate in it, because otherwise you, you are not part of the larger community. So in these kind of situations, um, I hope there will be more debate, but surprisingly there hasn't been much. When uh, um, biotechnology and genetic modification of organism, bio biological organisms were taking place in Europe particularly, there was a huge amount of debate you know, among the academics, the intellectuals, up among the leaders of the industry, and which really shaped the way in which the whole industry, you know, was, you know, eventually unfolded uh, with the labeling and all of this, which was, I thought, was a very responsible way of dealing with new reality, which is being created. And you know, the power of the digital technology is when we invent a a new product which becomes very widespread, we are actually creating new reality. And new reality demands a new ethical response, and responsibility. But we, you know, often as a society, we don't rise to that challenge of coming up with a critical discussion. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it is at some point this neck breaking speed has to slow down. But at the moment, it doesn't seem to be <laughs> slowing down. <laughs> So uh, we are very lucky. This book is, is basically, in a way, uh, Jinpa's coming out party. <laughs> <laughs> John, what you don't know about Jinpa is that he's actually very uh, eminent and famous in the Tibetan Buddhist uh, community for being a, a very highly uh, a respected scholar. And this is his coming out of, out of that community into our world, the modern society, and coming out as a teacher for the rest of us. The book is A Fearless Heart, available where books are sold, and my friends, Tupten Jinpa. <laughs>